Welcome to a delicious journey through the streets of New Orleans on this special episode of Gulf Coastal Connections. Join me as we set out to explore six distinct New Orleans restaurants in pursuit of the ultimate bowl of gumbo. And then I'm going to share with you my own family's recipe for chicken and sausage gumbo. So what are we waiting for? Let's dive into the flavors of the Crescent City. Hello, I'm Eddie Parker, and welcome to another episode of Gulf Coastal Connections. Today, we're kicking off our culinary adventure at the French Market in the Vue Carré. Picture this, the French Market, a pulsating collection of shops and stalls that stretches over six city blocks. It's a place steeped in history, a living, breathing reminder of its beginnings as a Native American trading post. And here's the twist. Despite its French-sounding name, it was founded during the Spanish period in 1791. Go figure. But let's get to the heart of why we're here. The French market is where the city's French community came to gather the ingredients for that quintessential Louisiana dish, gumbo. Gumbo is a cultural embodiment of New Orleans. It's a melting pot of cultures. Native American, African, French, Spanish, and even German all simmered together in one irresistible bowl. The word gumbo itself is a testament to this fusion, possibly derived from the African word gombo for okra or the Choctaw word combo for ground sassafras leaves, both key thickeners in this complex dish. And of course, there's the French contribution, a roux, a brown mixture of oil and flour that gives gumbo its rich texture. I know it sounds like a lot, but that's the beauty of gumbo. It's versatile. It's adaptable. You can throw in almost anything and it still works. But when it's done right, it's a revelation. Our first stop on this gumbo trail is the legendary Nolan's Cafe and Spice Emporium. This place is a haven for anyone serious about Cajun cuisine. Today we're on the hunt for filet powder, made from ground sassafras leaves. It's a thickener with deep Native American roots, used alone or with a root to create a filet gumbo. But let's not talk about it. Let's experience it. We're here, so we might as well dive into their gumbo. Let's see what this place is all about. First things first, this gumbo tastes like a warm southern hug, the kind you never forget. The shrimp, plump and bursting with flavor. The okra and sausage, abundant and perfectly balanced, bring in a harmonious dance to this culinary fiesta. And the chicken? It didn't steal the spotlight. It played its part. No drama, just pure, understated excellence. I'm an okra enthusiast, but let me tell you, this gumbo nailed it. The okra wasn't just there for thickness, it was there to dazzle your taste buds, adding a vibrant layer to an already complex dish. This is a roux-based masterpiece, y'all. This gumbo's so good, it made me do a happy dance right in my seat. Plus, it actually filled me up, and that's saying something. Now let's keep this party going and explore a few more places around town. Who's with me? On the banks of the Mississippi, in Algiers Point, there's a place called the Dry Dock Cafe. It's old New Orleans, sitting right there, greeting those off the ferry with the smell of seafood the kind that speaks to your bones. It's more than a cafe. It's a piece of the city's heart, tucked into the second oldest world. You walk in and it's like stepping through time. The walls covered in things from the sea and bits of the past set a scene. But it's the food that grabs you. Gumbo, thick with what the land and the waters offer. It came steaming to the table. The scent of it was honest and promising. It was filled with shrimp and sausage bound together by a roux, dark as the river's mud and just as deep. Each bite was like a Faulkner novel, simple and profoundly crafted. I ate slowly. The gumbo was good. It filled me. I was already planning to come back as I scooped the last of it from the bowl. In the rush of life, the dry dock stands as a reminder. There's joy and there's community right there at a table in Algiers Point. Laiuz is by the tracks, the kind of place you almost want to keep a secret, tucked away next to the pulsating New Orleans fairgrounds on Lopez Street. With roots tracing back to the 1930s, 
and a renaissance in 1996. This family-run joint has carved out its niche in the city's storied culinary landscape. Stepping inside, you're immediately wrapped in a warm, welcoming embrace. The history here isn't just on the walls, it's in the air, the food, and the people. Laiusa's commitment to preserving the essence of New Orleans cuisine is evident in every dish. The recipes handed down like treasured heirlooms deliver flavors that are both nostalgic and profound. Their gumbo, it's the stuff of legend, a hearty, soulful concoction that's been perfected over the generations. It's a steaming bowl of culinary bliss. Each shrimp sauteed to perfection, adding a fresh, delicate flavor to the rich, complex broth. The consistency was just right. Each spoonful a harmonious blend of taste that lingers on the palate. Opt for the chicken and sausage gumbo if that's more your speed. Just let your waiter know so the cook can take the shrimp out. A basket of bread accompanies the gumbo, essential for mopping up every last drop of that aromatic broth. Every bite was an affirmation of why La Uzo's remains a cornerstone of New Orleans dining. Leaving La Uzo's, I felt a lingering warmth, a comforting reminder of the meal and the place. This is a restaurant where the spirit of New Orleans cuisine is not just preserved, but celebrated. An experience that stays with you long after the meal is over. In New Orleans, Charles Pee Wee Armstrong is more than just a name. He's a culinary force, a man whose seafood empire has come to define the city's diverse palate. Pee Wee's journey began humbly, delivering fresh, savory meals directly to folks' door and running a pop-up in a CBD bar that quickly became the talk of the town. As word of his culinary power spread, so did his operation. Takeout shops popped up in Central City and New Orleans East, becoming essential destinations for anyone seeking standout seafood. But it wasn't Gentilly where Pee Wee truly made his mark. Pee Wee's Crab Cakes, a counter service joint, turned into a mecca for seafood lovers, drawing patrons from every corner of the city. The seafood gumbo at Pee Wee's is nothing short of a masterpiece. Packed with meaty crab legs, plump shrimp, and hearty slices of sausage, this gumbo is a rich tapestry of flavors that captures the essence of New Orleans cuisine. Each ingredient melts perfectly with the next, creating a robust, cohesive dish seasoned to perfection. The balance of heat and natural flavors means there is no need for Tabasco or seasonings. What sets this gumbo apart is its remarkable affordability. In a city known for its extreme opulence and poverty, Pee Wee's Gumbo bridges the gap, offering a luxurious dining experience at a price that welcomes everyone. This accessibility invites diners from all walks of life to partake in the distinctive tastes of New Orleans without the worry of a hefty bill. Each spoonful of gumbo not only satisfies the palate, but connects you to the rich, lively spirit of the city. It's more than a meal, it's a cultural experience. For anyone looking to understand and appreciate the unique allure of New Orleans cuisine, Pee Wee's Gumbo is a must try. At Pee Wee's Crab Cakes, the atmosphere buzzes with energy. The service is swift and the menu is broad. Together, these elements plainly explain why Pee Wee's name and food are so vital to the vibrant culinary scene of New Orleans. Stepping into Cafe Pantaba, you feel the heartbeat of New Orleans reverberate through every inch of its historic walls. Located on the iconic Jackson Square at the intersection of St. Peter's and Charter Streets, this quaint eatery resides in the Upper Pantaba Building, one half of a meticulous preserved 19th century row house duo. The menu is a siren call of regional delight. I ordered a steaming bowl of Creole gumbo, and it was a sight to behold, with heaps of fluffy rice accompanied by a side of crackers that felt like a nod to family dinner. The gumbo itself was a rich, flavorful symphony, brimming with plump shrimp in every spoonful, a testament to the dish's Creole roots. The blend of flavors was harmonious, with the okra and celery dancing through the robust broth a crab claw nestled within, adding an element of delightful surprise. And with a dash of Louisiana hot sauce, 
Each bite became an exhilarating interplay of spicy and savory, sending my taste buds into a jubilant frenzy. But Cafe Pantaba isn't just about the food. It's about the full immersion into the soul of the Big Easy. The service, characterized by impeccable Southern hospitality, enhances the experience, making each visit a warm and welcoming affair. It's a place that calls you back time and time again, urging you to savor its unique blends of flavors and atmosphere. For those seeking a genuine taste of Creole and Cajun cuisine, Cafe Pantaba stands as a beacon of culinary excellence. Come for the food, stay for the ambiance, and lose yourself in the flavors that are the very essence of New Orleans. Pierre Antoine sits at the bustling corner of Royal and St. Anne, right in the heart of the French Quarter. Established in 1995, this venerable eatery has become a beloved fixture for locals and tourists alike. Here you can look outside, soaking in the vibrant atmosphere, and watch the world go by, all while savoring the authentic flavors of Louisiana cuisine. Pierre Antoine serves food all day, transitioning seamlessly from breakfast to lunch to dinner. The portions are generous, ensuring you leave satisfied, and they stay true to their rich culinary traditions. Expect to find an array of dishes featuring crawfish, oysters, and other local favorites, each prepared with a level of expertise that speaks to their commitment to quality. I ordered a bowl of gumbo, and it came to the table hot and steamy. It's enticing aroma a prelude to the flavors within. The gumbo was served with a dark roux, a visual promise of depth and richness. The first spoonful delivered on that promise, bold flavors that didn't overwhelm, but offered a perfect canvas for a bit of added spice. I reached for the Louisiana hot sauce, and it elevated the dish to another level. The gumbo was packed with tender pink shrimp and a surprising addition of tomatoes. While tomatoes aren't a traditional ingredient in bayou-style gumbo, they work beautifully here, adding a subtle sweetness and acidity that complemented the dish's hearty flavors. Each spoonful was a joy, right down to the last bite. Pierre Antoine's prides itself on sourcing local ingredients, ensuring that every dish is fresh and tastes as it should. This dedication to local sourcing not only supports the community, but also guarantees that the food maintains an authentic taste. The prices were reasonable, making it accessible for both regulars and newcomers. People keep coming back to Pierre Antoine's, not just for the food, but for the entire experience. The combination of excellent cuisine, warm service, and the vibrant setting of the French Quarter makes every visit special. It's a place where the essence of New Orleans comes alive, making it an integral part of the city's culinary landscape. Pierre Antoine's isn't just a restaurant, it's a piece of New Orleans history, a place where you can taste the soul of the city in every dish. Whether you're a local or just passing through, make sure to stop by, sit back, and enjoy the flavors and hospitality that define this remarkable restaurant. All right, folks, this is something very special. I'm going to teach you how to make my family's recipe of a Cajun chicken and sausage gumbo. Down in the Bayou country where gumbo is king, the roux reigns supreme. It's a solemn art, the browning of this mix. Fat melted with flour, worked until it turns the color of the deep earth. There's a truth held in the kitchens down in Cajun land that a good gumbo roux takes as long as drinking two beers, no less. It's about the clock, it's about that color, that rich, dark hue akin to aged chocolate, a sign of a roux done right. Essential to both Cajun and Creole hands, as sacred as the holy trinity of onion, celery, and bell pepper. But mind this, the darker the roux, the more it sings of flavor, it trades its thickening power with each shade it deepens. Here, patience is not just a virtue, but a necessity, for in the making of a gumbo, as in life, the best outcomes often come to those who wait. These are the tools you will need to make a good roux your very first time out. First, you will need a pot that can stand up to the task. An enameled cast iron Dutch oven is always best. It holds the heat steady and true. Use the same pot for the roux you will for the gumbo. It saves wasting and the flavors build one upon the other. 
It's the practical way, the way of simplicity and strength. For this task, a proper stirring tool is essential. Begin your roux with a whisk to chase away any lumps of flour. Then switch to an old trusty wooden spoon. It should feel right in your hand, strong enough to scrape the bottom of the pot thoroughly as you stir. Always avoid using anything plastic to stir your roux. The roux runs hot and plastic can melt, spoiling the mix. Stick with that old wooden spoon. It's reliable and enduring. A roux has only two ingredients. It starts with a simple measurement, one cup of flour to one cup of oil. As the roux cooks, it transforms. The flour undergoing what they call the Maillard reaction. This is no simple browning, but a chemical ballet with sugars and proteins in the flour deepen, darken, turn rich and nutty in their taste. Remember, as you cook the roux longer, its power to thicken wanes. Each moment on the fire changes it, lessens it in a way, enriches it in another. Step one, whisk. Whisk the flour and oil together over medium high heat, making sure there are no lumps. Work it until it is smooth. For a white roux, it takes just two or three minutes. It's potent for thickening, best used for soups, stews, or gravy. Its flavor is mild, unassuming, but effective. After five minutes, Turn the heat down to medium low and keep stirring. Now's the time to switch to the wooden spoon. In another five minutes, you'll see the roux turn blonde. This blonde roux, taking perhaps five to 10 minutes, still thickens well, but begins to have a hint at a nutty flavor. It's the sort you use for a bechamel, perfect for creamy pasta sauces. Keep stirring, never stop. Scrape the sides and bottom as you go. After about 25 minutes, you should be looking at a brown roux. This stage, they call it the peanut butter roux because of its lighter brown shade, like the heart of a good jar of peanut butter. It sings with a deep, nutty flavor but holds back some of its thickening power. Here, you stop if you're making a etouffee or a stew. It's just right for that. After 30 to 45 minutes of constant stirring, your roux should deepen to the color of dark chocolate. This is what you use for your gumbo, a dark brown roux. Taking up to an hour offers the richest flavor, ideal for gumbo, though it thickens the least. Be watchful as the roux darkens the color changes quicker, a moment too long and it can burn, turning bitter, so be careful. Keep a steady hand and a keen eye. This is no task for the hurried or the distracted. Here are some expert tips for making a roux for a gumbo. Don't burn it. This is the cardinal rule of making a roux. A burnt roux turns bitter, speckled with black, like a bad night without stars. Once burnt, there's no salvaging it. You must begin again. There's no glory in a burnt roux, only the promise of starting fresh. The best defense against a burnt roux is to stir, then stir some more and do not stop. Do not walk away, not even for a bathroom break. Make sure to scrape down the sides and bottom of the pot evenly. It's the constant attention, the unwavering hand that keeps the roux from the char and ruin of neglect. When you're new to the art of the roux, keep the heat low. You might be tempted to turn it up, to hurry the process alone, but don't, especially if you're new to this. High heat is a quick path to burn, raising the odds of burning your roux. Patience is your ally here, slow and steady, like the movement of time itself. Be gentle, be careful. Hot roux is like lava, it will burn. Stir it gently to keep it from leaping out of the pot onto your skin. Chef Paul Prudhomme called it Cajun napalm for a reason. When cooking roux, especially over the hottest fires, wear long sleeves. It's about respect, the kind you give to something powerful enough to hurt you. Don't break it. Roux can break, the fat and flour parting ways into a greasy chaos, and nobody wants that. This happens when temperatures shift too swiftly, so never ever toss cold ingredients like the Cajun Holy Trinity or chicken broth into a hot roux. 
Such sudden changes are akin to abrupt weather at sea. Best avoided to keep your course true and steady. Slowly add your liquid ingredients a few cups at a time. Stir them in and check the thickness of the roux. Remember, the longer a roux cooks, the less it thickens. Pouring all your stock in at once will leave you with a thin soup, not a thick gumbo. Go slow. You can always introduce more fluids gradually to adjust the thickness to your liking. Like navigating a river, it's about reading the currents and adjusting your approach. There you have it folks, my top six picks for the best bowl of gumbo in the city of New Orleans. And my own family's recipe for Cajun chicken and sausage gumbo. Now here's your part to play. Uncle Eddie wants you to subscribe, hit that like button, leave a comment, and share it with your fellow food enthusiasts. It really helps support the channel and allows us to keep bringing you these adventures. And remember, it ain't goodbye. It's see you next Tuesday on Gulf Coastal Connections.